to apps across the curriculum week two for those of you who are joining us for the second week and second webinar of the online module apps across the curriculum supporting all learners and this particular webinar is going to be supporting all learners with Chrome apps and extensions. Last week we talked about iOS apps for the iPad and iOS devices, and this week we're going to be focusing on the Chrome browser and Chrome apps and extensions. For those of you who may be joining us new this week, welcome. I'm Diana Petschauer. I'm a ResNA certified assistive technology professional and founder of the company Assistive Technology for Education. My consultants and I do travel throughout New England as well as nationally and provide the assistive technology evaluations and assessments as well as training. We also provide large professional development workshops and training and webinars similar to this one, live hands-on. And we do provide the follow-up services as needed for students to access college and post-secondary as well as adults to access employment. And so what I wanted to start with is just a quick jump over to CTD, Center on Technology and Disability. This is their website. Hopefully most of you are familiar if you've registered for the webinar. And wanted to remind you that this is part of a three-week online module, online course. It is free, but it does offer CEUs if you complete the course. It is not too late to register. If you're attending today, you're watching the second webinar. The first one was recorded and is posted. There is a discussion board with a couple of questions and a place to discuss apps further with the group, and then an activity to implement some of what you're learning. So if you are interested in that, attendees who complete all course requirements on time by September 6th, and it's not a lot if you need to catch up, if you complete all three webinars, modules, and activities by September 6th, you will automatically automatically be issued the CEUs by ResNA in PDF format. CTD will be sending out a one-time list. And for those of you who may want to complete the course in your own time, so you don't feel rushed, you are absolutely welcome to do that. You will be contacting ResNA to request the corresponding CEUs after you complete it. And we will be posting that information for Melissa Campbell at ResNA. Her email and phone number will be posted. However, there will be a $16 fee. So considering the course is free, still very reasonable if you want to complete it in your own time and pay the $16 for the CEUs. Otherwise, they will be free if you are interested in completing the online module by September 6th. So please feel free to check out the website, participate, and join afterwards if you are not already signed up and if you're interested in doing so. And then we get to chat even further all week about any questions you might have and other apps and extensions that I'm not able to show. So this week we are going Google. And what I want to share with you, and it is a link on the right-hand side of your screen. I'm sharing my screen right now, so what you see should be my screen. and. There is also on the right-hand side a link to this Google Doc. You can click on that link, and hopefully it will bring you to this Google Doc. This will be saved automatically in your Google Drive. We'll talk about that if you're not familiar. You can print this. You'll be able to save it as a Word document later if you prefer. But this is what we're going to be using for today's training, and it will be available to you to save in your drive or to have after the training and webinar concludes so that you can refer back to it. At the top is my contact information, so feel free to follow up at any time. Certainly connect with AT for Education on Twitter and Facebook if you're interested in a lot of great, awesome assistive technology posts and upcoming trainings and webinars. But certainly we talk about all things assistive technology for all abilities and disabilities on there. Feel free to connect. And you see that URL right here, HTTP colon slash. If you type this or copy and paste it into your URL above here, where my mouse is, like you're going to that site, if you copy and paste it in there, you'll get to a copy of this Google Doc as well. So whichever you prefer, the link on the right-hand side of the page, or copy and paste this link, and you will be able 
or you can certainly just type it above in your URL as well. If you're walking, looking at my screen and you don't have the document in front of you, I'll wait a minute for any of you who might be doing that. Just take this address here in the blue, http colon backslash bit.ly, and the rest of it. Type it right into your URL and you will get to this Google Doc. The second thing you need to know, in case you are not familiar at all, you will need the Chrome browser in order to use these apps and extensions. It is free. You can download it. If you have the Google Doc open, there are some hyperlinks for you to click on right there so that you can download the Chrome browser. Again, if you're not familiar, the Chrome browser on the bottom of my screen here, where my mouse is, looks like a little circle with red, green, and yellow, and blue in the middle. Some people call it a beach ball. So you do need the Chrome browser in order for these apps and extensions to work. They will not work in Internet Explorer, Safari, Firefox, etc. These are specifically Chrome apps and extensions that work in the Chrome browser. So if you'd like to follow along today or use them in the future, you will want to download that browser. Now downloading the apps and extensions that we're going to talk about, you're going to do that from the Chrome Web Store. So you can see the top of my page, I have many tabs opened. My Google Drive we'll be talking about, Twitter and Pinterest boards, my website, CTD. When we click on this new tab icon all the way to the right where my mouse is covered, or if you just start the Chrome browser for the first time, you're going to see up in the top left-hand corner this little icon. I'm hovered over it and it says apps. It's a little square of mini squares. Some people call it a waffle. And if you are using a Chromebook, it may be located in a different part of your screen. But this is the icon that you're looking for. The squares may also be black to the right side of your screen over here as I move my mouse. And it also says Google Apps. I like to use the one in the top left because it brings me to all of my apps, which I'm going to show you. So once you've downloaded the Chrome browser, this icon will be available on the screen when you open up a new window. And you want to click on that little square of squares or that little waffle of squares. This now brings me to my main page of several apps. You will not have all of these downloaded yet though you may end up downloading them by the end of the training or later as you are trying them out yourself. But the app or apps that you will always see available for you to use are the Web Store, Google Drive, Gmail, and the applications such as Google Docs and Google Sheets. So you will be able to come here by clicking on that little square square that says app. And then you're going to come to this icon here. I'm hovered over it with my mouse again. It looks like that little beach ball in a beach bag. And when you hover over it, it says web store. It also says web store underneath it. But with my background, it's difficult to see it's hidden in a tree. So that is the web store. It is just like the web store if you're using another I a device like an iPad. But this is the web store for Chrome apps and extensions. This is where you're going to download the apps and extensions that we're talking about today. When you click on Web Store, you'll see now we're opened in the Web Store. So the left-hand side is that search feature up in the top left. And you can search for the apps and extensions that I'm showing today. You may want to watch first and then decide if it's something you'll use. You may decide to download them after the training and play with them. 
And I do encourage you to come back to this web store to search for apps and extensions that you may want to use with your students. My list, I feel, is a phenomenal one that you may end up using with your students, but it's certainly not exhaustive. And these are just some of the apps and extensions that you may find, and you may end up finding some of your own that you prefer or that your students prefer. So you do want to search by feature or subject, such as text-to-speech, mind mapping and brainstorming, math, biology, things of that nature. You want to search for the feature or the subject that your students are studying or the tools and supports that they need. So the first extension that I'm going to search for, and I've typed it into that search in the top left of the web store, is called Extensity. And when I hit Enter, you can see now a list of extensions as an option. And it is the top one that I'm recommending. It looks like a little yin-yang. I already have this downloaded. Extensions don't show up on the main page of apps where we were previously. Extensions show up as little symbols to the right-hand side of your browser. So I'm moving my mouse up there now and hovering over this little yin-yang symbol. And it says Extensity. And the Google Doc points out this tip. Before you do anything else, download this extension. You may or may not choose to do this. I'm going to click on the extension icon. This is free. Many of the apps and extensions I'm showing you today are free. Now I just clicked on Extensity. And you can see it brings down this nice list. This is the list of the apps and extensions that I have downloaded. By clicking on them, it enables them or turns them on. If I click on them again, it turns them off or disables them. This is excellent if you end up downloading several apps and extensions. You can see my list is extensive. The apps are at the bottom there. And you can also launch apps from Extensity. We'll be going over many of these today, this afternoon. So this is the way that you can turn on or off very quickly and easily any of these extensions that you want to use. The reason why this is helpful, several reasons, you can see as I start to enable them, all of these nice symbols showing up to the right of my browser. I'll be able to click on them to use them. Extensions do take up memory and slow down your computer. So if you are on a laptop or a desktop or even a tablet and you're using these Chrome apps and extensions, you most likely will only need to use one or two at a time, maybe three or four collaboratively. But you certainly won't need all of the apps and extensions running at one time. If they start to act glitchy, uh, you certainly want to try a refresh. That's also a tip offered in the Google Doc. And you want to try turning off one or two of the after extensions that you're not using. So I'm going to enable and disable some of these extensions as we're, we are going over them today so that I'm not taking up too, mem too much memory at one time. And also it's important as you download extensions, download one at a time and use one at a time. Then open up another one and use that second one in collaboration with the first one if you're looking to see if they play nicely together. Most of the time, these apps and extensions do work well together, but there certainly have been some glitches caused by one or two being open at the same time, especially if they do similar things. So if they start acting glitchy, try a refresh. And if that doesn't work, you definitely want to try closing one or two after extensions and only having a couple open at one time. So I'm going to make sure that I have the first few that I want to show to you according to our Google Doc here. And the others I'll just disable for the time being, but we will be going through most of them. So some people want to know what is the difference between apps and extensions, and how are these different from extensions that you would use, or apps rather, how are these different from apps you would use on the iPad or an iOS device? So last week, we talked about apps on the iOS devices. Again, these are Chrome apps and extensions. We're getting them from the Chrome Web Store in the Chrome browser. 
these AFSM extensions, these additional educational AFSM extensions that we are getting from this web store work on any Mac or PC, any laptop or desktop computer. They work on tablets, such as Android tablets like the Nexus tablet, Windows Dell tablets, um, for example. They also work on Chromebooks, of course. Many schools are getting Chromebooks and going Google. So these extensions certainly work on Chromebooks and these apps. The apps that will work on the iPad are only the Google Drive and Google Docs and those types of word processing apps from Google. Google Drive, Google Sheets, Google Docs, the equivalent of things you would see like Microsoft Office Word, PowerPoint, etc. Google Drive is available on every device always, um, including the iPad. But these additional apps and extensions that I'm showing you today for education through the Chrome Web Store cannot be used on the iPad or the iOS devices. That's what we did last week. We worked with those apps last week. This week, we're working with the Chrome apps and extensions. And I like to say everything but the iPad, because just about everything but the iPad these work on to support your students in all environments. So the great thing about these apps and extensions is that they follow the student's login. That means when they log into their Google account, your students should have a Google account if your school is using Google for education. Most times your IT sets them up with an email and a Google account, and you might have one as an educator as well. When you or your students sign in with your Google account and you download these apps and extensions, they are now linked to your account or linked to your student's account. That means if you log off this laptop or desktop or tablet and you go home and log in on your own computer or your student goes home, to do homework and logs in on their own computer, these apps and extensions are already going to be downloaded and waiting for them to use. They don't need to do it again. There's no software to install. It follows them. It will follow them if they log in to their Google account at the local library or at a friend's house or a relative's house. These apps and extensions follow them, which is really nice. So they have these supports at school as well as other environments just by logging in and downloading these apps and extensions once. And for you as well as educators, if you end up using these apps and extensions, they will follow your Google sign-in as well. As we go through the webinar, please feel free to use the chat at the bottom of your screen. I believe it is for you. And type in any questions that you have along the way. I'll be pausing periodically, and administration will be reading your questions out loud to me. So if you do have any questions about anything that I'm showing you today, feel free to type them right into that chat and I'll try to answer as many as possible. And if you are attending the course, of course you can pose any questions throughout the week on the discussion board, and we can go over it then as well. Diana? Yes. Yes, there is a question that's in the chat, and I think you may have covered this, but um, Cheryl Gannon is asking, should we be on Chrome in order to participate today? And I think she's talking about the app that you're covering. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. So I will clarify at the beginning of the Google Doc, you can access that link to the right side of the screen. And it does show here you do need to have the Chrome browser in order to download and use these apps and extensions. So you can either click on the right-hand side to get that Google Doc, which is what I have open now. If you can't get it from the link, you can type this blue URL link, HTTP, et cetera, into your browser at the top there, your URL browser. If you type that in and click Enter, you'll get to this Google Doc as well. And then there are some hyperlinks just below that for you to click on to download the Chrome browser. It is free. It's just another browser to access the internet. But it is the browser that has the web store. So these apps and extensions will not work in Internet Explorer, Safari, Firefox, et cetera. These will only work in the Chrome browser. Thank you for that question. So we're moving along. We learned how to get to the Chrome Web Store and to download some of the apps and extensions. Now the difference between apps and extensions, as I mentioned, when you download apps, if you click on that icon to the top left again, that little square square, this is where your apps will show up. 
If you have many of them like I do, there's a little arrow to the right-hand side. And you can see you can go through several pages of apps. You can move them just by clicking and holding and moving those apps if you want to categorize them or move them together. And apps work as a standalone. If I click on one of these apps, which I'll be demonstrating many of them to today, they do their own thing. They're an app. They work on their own. The extensions set of those little symbols to the right-hand side of my browser. My mouse is hovering over some of them now. These extensions are an extension of your browser or the internet, meaning these are going to affect the internet website that you're on. And we're going to go over that. You're going to see how that affects the internet website as you're researching or as your students are researching. And the first thing that we're going to do is go over our list of extensions. I'm going to demonstrate several of them to you. Again, this is not an exhaustive list. It's just a list to get started with. And you'll be able to search the web store and download any apps and extensions yourself for free and try them. And it is risk-free because you can delete them if you don't like them. If for those of you who are using Chromebooks, you know that Chromebooks, you cannot download software. You cannot put software on them. So if you have students who are currently using literacy software or other software to support them for things such as text-to-speech, voice recognition, et cetera, you can't download software on the Chromebook, but you can download these apps and extensions to support them with similar features. And that's what we're going to discuss today. So we're on the Google Doc, and we're going to go through the extensions first, and then the app. And again, as we go through, feel free to type any questions down into the chat, and I'll pause along the way to try and answer the majority of the questions this afternoon. So we're going to start. What I am doing is I'm going to a website. You can feel free if you are following along. Keep that app store open in one window. So if you go to your waffle icon or the little square squares and you click on the beach ball and the beach bag that says web store, you want to keep this web store open in one window. So that way, as I'm mentioning apps and extensions that you may like and want to download, you type them right in here in your search. And when that extension pops up, such as read and write, which we're going to go over next, you hit enter. And now options are here. The extension I'm going to show you first is called read and write for Google. It looks like this little purple puzzle piece. If you do not have it and you want it, your little button should say Add to Chrome with a plus button. And you're going to click on that plus button and add it. And you'll have it. As you start to use it, which I'm going to show you how, you're going to have some messages pop up on your screen asking you to accept and allow access. You need to click Accept and Allow Access or these apps and extensions won't work. So if you receive those messages along the way, click Accept. If you already have it downloaded, you'll see a little icon that says Rate It. So feel free to rate any of the apps and extensions that you like, very similar to other app stores. So keep this web store open so that you can search for these apps and extensions as we go along if you choose. They are already listed on the dock, so if you feel like going ahead, so hopefully you'll still be paying attention to what we're doing, you can download some of these as we go along as well. In the New tab, if you click to open a new tab, you just want to navigate to a website that you want to read about with some information. You can feel free to go to our website, atford.com, atford.com. You can go to the CTD course website if you'd like. I'm opening up a website about Aristotle. I like this. I just Googled the word Aristotle, the second or third one down. I like this website because it has a lot of text to be read. And so it works well to show and demonstrate these apps and extensions in this particular website. Feel free to go here as well if you'd like to. You can see the URL at the top of the page. We want to make sure that we have read and write for Google enabled. We do. So let's do a refresh here. There we go. So when you've downloaded Read and Write for Google, 
It shows up as this little purple puzzle piece in your URL bar. My mouse is hovered over it at the top of the page. It's right next to your star for favorite. Read and write for Google. When you click on this purple puzzle piece, is a comprehensive toolbar that will work on the internet as well as in Google Docs and PDFs that your students have saved in their Google Drive. And we're going to talk about Google Drive a little bit more as we go along as well. You can see that I can move this toolbar. I'm just clicking and dragging it on the page from the top of that gray section there. And there are several tools that are available in this toolbar. The first is text-to-speech. There's two ways to use text-to-speech while the student's researching on the internet to have the information read out loud to them. The first icon that looks like a little mouth over speech bubble is hover speech. When I click on there, I can hover over where I want to begin reading so I don't have to select any text, and it will begin the text-to-speech. There might be a little bit of an echo. I'm going to turn the volume up a little bit so that you can hear the text-to-speech from the Read and Write for Google. It is a very nice, pleasant-sounding voice. And I'm going to click Hover Speech and hover where I want to begin reading. So if there's an echo, it's only because of the webinar. I'm going to turn down my volume again. If you're using it on your own or trying it, you won't hear the echo, of course. So that's hover speech. There's also the option. You can see the play button, pause button, just like a typical DVD player. There's the option to just highlight the text with the mouse and then hit the play button if that's preferred. The pause and the stop buttons are there. If you have downloaded this and you're trying it yourself and you have a male voice, there's a much nicer sounding pleasant female voice by going into your settings. I'll click OK real quick. So to the right side of the toolbar, looks like a little gear icon. My mouse is hovered over it. And when you click on there, it does bring your settings up. And if you want the nice, pleasant, natural sounding voice, that is Ava, you can choose. And you can see there's also many other voices for students to try, including those with accents or from other countries. It's currently on medium speed. You can slow it down to slow or very slow or even speed it up to fast. Continuous reading means you won't have to continue highlighting the text. It will just continue reading what's on the page. And one word translation is available while your students are on the internet to these languages. So if your student is an ESL or ESOL learner, English language learner, or if they are learning a new language and speak English, this can be very helpful as they're researching and get to a word they're not familiar with and have it translated. When you're done choosing your settings, click OK, and that box disappears. So while your students are researching, using this extension allows text-to-speech to have the information read out loud to them. There's also the dictionary feature. So if I highlight a word I'm not familiar with, I'm highlighting to the top right the word philosophy with my mouse and then go back to my toolbar, and this little book icon is a dictionary. So if I click on dictionary, I can get the definition. And if I click on this definition, I can have it read out loud to me. So very handy that they don't have to go to dictionary.com. If they get to a word they're not familiar with, they can just click on dictionary and close that out and, of course, listen to that definition out loud if they need to. There is also a picture dictionary. So if they need some additional picture support from the picture library, 
I'm going to highlight that same word, philosophy, and now click on the picture dictionary icon. It's right next to the dictionary icon in the toolbar. And you can see their little icon for philosophy. So if this is helpful for your students to have a visual of, of the words that they're looking up as well, that's an option. This little globe with the magnifying glass icon, I'm hovered over now, is called Fact Finder. So as a cross-referencing tool, if your student gets to a word they're not familiar with, such as Athens, I just highlighted, and then they want to find something out about Athens and cross-reference, because they have no knowledge of Athens. So before they continue reading about this particular page of Aristotle, they want to find out about a little bit more about Athens. So they highlight the word Athens, and now they click on Fact Finder, and it simply brings them to information about Athens. So now they have the Aristotle page and the Athens information to research. The icon with the two arrows, that is the translator button. So again, if you need to have the one word translated at a time to the language that you chose while you were in your setting. And these highlighters are phenomenal. This is definitely a universal design technology and tool. It is being used in many schools, K-12 as well as post-secondary, supporting all learners, but certainly there to support your struggling learners as they need it. The highlighters are a great example of this. As students are researching on the website, typically they're going to be looking at the page, writing down important information, looking at the website again, writing down important information. And for many students, that's a very time-consuming task. For students who have difficulty writing down important information, fine motor, writing difficulties, struggle with struggling with writing, may be hard for them to write the information. But if they can use these highlighters, they can highlight the important information just like they would typically do with a regular highlighter on a worksheet or a page or a book. But they're highlighting the information on the website instead of having to write it down. Now they could just use one color if that's the way they're studying. But these colored highlighters are offered in different colors for categorizing. So for example, if they're doing a country project, maybe they want to separate clothing from food, from geography, et cetera. So they could use different colors. Likewise, different teachers who are using this tool to teach use the highlighters for different parts of speech and things like that. After the student has taken highlights, and what's great about these highlighters is after you've gone through the entire website and collected those highlights of important information that the student wants to use perhaps for writing a paper or doing a report, you can then collect these highlights. So my mouse has hovered over the collect highlights icon. So we are going to collect the highlights. You can order them by color or by the position in the document that you took them. We'll choose color and then click OK. And what this does is it takes all of this highlighted information, all the highlights that we took on that website, and as you can see, it pulls it into a new Google Doc. So now they have all of those important highlights collected in one place. And what's wonderful at the bottom, you see it saves the link to the website, Aristotle. So a lot of times students are researching, they collect important information, and then they forget what website they were on to get back to. So this saves that website for them to get right back to that particular website page. So we have our highlights in a Google Doc. Some of your options in this Google Doc, um, you will have the toolbar, the read and write toolbar. Um, and, but just a little overview of Google Docs in general. It is your option to use as a word processor that works along with Google Drive. What's neat about Google Docs is this automatically saves in the student's Google Drive. So typically, if they were using a Microsoft Office document, most times they're used to hitting File, Save As, and having to save to their documents. These Google Docs automatically save to the student's drive. So that saves a lot of time. In the top left where it says Highlights Untitled, I'm just going to click there. And this is where you rename a document. 
You could also click on File Rename, but you can click right here to name the document. So I would name this Aristotle, for example. And you do want to encourage your students to name documents, especially if they're taking highlights or creating new documents. They want to name them immediately because they do save automatically to Drive, and they don't want to have a lot of untitled documents that they have to go through and find. So the Google Doc itself is able to be shared with that Share button to the top right-hand corner. You can make it private. You can share it with individuals and have them edit it. You can share it with individuals and have them view only, meaning they can read it, but they can't change it. This is a great collaboration tool for teachers to share documents with one student or several students at a time. This is also a great way for students to share work immediately with their teachers without having to email it. It's going to show up in the educator's Gmail, or Google Drive, rather. So if a student shares a document with you and you're an educator, it goes right to your drive, so you're able to find it and score it, offer feedback. The other great thing about Google Docs is that more than one person can be working on a Google Doc at a time, and everyone sees the change in real time. So if you've never used Google Docs, or your students have not used Google Docs before, it looks a lot like Microsoft Office Word or any other word processing program they might be used to using. They can change the text size, and the color, and bold, and italicized, and all the things they're typically used to doing. But if they're working on a paper or project with a friend or a group, they can all be typing at the same time, and they're going to see those changes immediately. Also a great way for you as educators to collaborate with other educators in a meeting. You see those changes in real time. Students can work with each other from different homes or different locations and all contribute. So another great thing about the Google Docs, as I mentioned, is it saves automatically to a student's Google Drive. So I'm just clicking on my Google Drive. For those of you who this may be new to and you're not familiar, if you open a new tab or new window in Google Chrome browser, and you click on that little square of square again that says Apps in the top left-hand corner, as I mentioned, one of the apps that will always be available here for you is your Google Drive. I'm hovered over it. It's in my top right. It may be located somewhere else on your page. You can click and drag to move it where you want it to. So you can always get to your Google Drive very quickly and easily from the app icon. And when a student's in Google Drive, some really great features of Google Drive, again, this saves all of their documents, whether it's a Google Doc, a PDF, a spreadsheet, PowerPoint. They can create folders, some example folders where my mouse is. I have language arts, and it's purple, math, and it's red, science, and it's green. So they can create a folder for every subject very quickly and easily. Just click on New and Folder. Or this is also how they can click on New Google Doc if they wanted to start a new Google Doc. A Google Spreadsheet, Google Slides is their version of PowerPoint, but it's a Google, Google Slide presentation. They can upload files. So if you or students already have hundreds of documents, five documents saved on your computer, and you want to now have them in your Google Drive, or upload them as a Word document. And so you can start a new folder, color code it, and then when you are sharing documents with your students, whether it's math, science, social studies, etc., they can save those documents right in those folders. And they can also create a new folder very quickly and easily. You can see new folder, name it, and it's saved in their Google Drive. This is a really, really great way for students to be more organized, especially those who lose a lot of homework in their backpack or tend to come to school where things crumbled up or it gets lost in their desk. By saving everything on Google Drive and putting it into folders, you're avoiding a lot of that hassle for those students and helping them to be organized. And they're, of course, becoming independent as organizers for themselves. So we took those highlights and exported to a Google Doc. And I'm just going to delete or move this Google Doc to the trasher right now because we're going to go back to the website where we were using the extension, Read and Write for Google. So they've taken highlights on the internet website. If they want to get rid of these highlights, you can re-highlight with your mouse and sweep away the highlights. 
So we just deleted the highlights. We were highlighting on the internet website with the color-coded highlighters. We exported all those highlights onto my nice Google Doc and saved it in our drive automatically. And by re-highlighting with my mouse and clicking on the broom, clear highlights, it cleared away those highlights. And now we have that blank website again. Another great tool is this vocabulary tool. And now this will work again whether you're in an internet website in Chrome or if you're in a Google Doc. And I'm going to demonstrate these tools in a Google Doc afterwards. We're just finishing up on the website. And so with the vocabulary tool, the student can highlight words that may be vocabulary words that their educator or teacher has chosen for them. So I'm just highlighting the word medicine and using the yellow highlighter. Maybe the teacher instructed them to find words that they're not familiar with. And they can certainly highlight the words that they're not familiar with just by highlighting with their mouse, clicking on a color highlighter. We'll do one more. We'll do family. So if there's a word that they're not familiar with and they want this to become part of their vocabulary that they're learning that goes along with the lesson or curriculum, they could highlight the words here. Similarly, if we were in a Google Doc and the teacher or you as an educator shared with your students a list of vocabulary words that you wanted them to define, they could simply use the highlighter to define, uh, to highlight each of the words. So we highlighted the vocabulary words that the student may not be familiar with. And now we click on this vocabulary tool. And again, this vocabulary tool brings all of those highlighted words into a new Google Doc. And it's going to pop up in just a minute. It's creating that vocabulary list in a nice table format. Here we go, untitled, and it's loading. So it took those words that we highlighted, those vocabulary words and from the internet. Rejoining again. And it puts it into a nice table format. Rejoining again. Sorry about this. I'm going to use my extensory to turn off a few more extensions just to make sure that that is not the reason behind it, hopefully not. We'll just open them as I show them to you. So we have the word that we highlighted, a meaning or definition, a symbol if there's one from the symbol library, as you can see, and then a notes section. And it's in a nice table format. It is editable, so of course, this is a very long definition. We could delete, or we could add to it, type right in here. The notes section, you could put it into a sentence. Some educators like to rename this section and put it as synonyms, for example, and have the student put synonyms in here. You can think of many different ways. This is a typical table, so if you right-click on the end of it, you can insert rows to the left or the right if you want it to make it a bigger table and add some more options for an activity. So now they have this nice vocabulary list with the word, the definition, the symbol, and they can share this with each other. They can do this as a group independently, or if you're doing it together as a class, maybe you're projected on your smart board or your whiteboard, you can now use that blue share button in the top right hand corner and share it with all of your students. And again, as I mentioned, with every Google Doc, you want to make sure in the top left that you are making sure to name your document. So maybe this is vocabulary list. Aristotle from the lesson that you were teaching. And now this automatically saves in your drive. And when the students receive it as a shared document, they can save it in their drive. If the student was creating this, of course, it's going to save automatically in their Google Drive. And they can file it into any folder as they create it for organization. So all of these tools work with in Google Drive and Google Docs, if your students are using that or begin to use that. Move this one to the trash and go back to our website. And once again, I'm just going to highlight those words and tweak them away, tweak away those highlights. And the last icon on this toolbar when you're working on the internet is called Simplified Page. The Simplified Page button is excellent, especially if your student is researching on a website where there's videos playing or ads trying to sell something. 
most websites they go to now, unfortunately, when they're researching, unless you have an educational filter, which is nice. But if you don't, when they're researching at home or at school, those annoying videos pop off the ads, and it's very distracting for the student to concentrate on what they're trying to research. So the Simplify button, if they're in a website where that happens, or if they just want less distraction in a simplified environment for reading, the Simplify button now takes that particular website and brings them into a new page with a simplified text. So it's the same text that was on the website. As you can see, the website is still open in the tab right next to it. This is the simplified version. They can still have it read out loud to them. They can still highlight important information. They can choose to simplify it even more. And to the right is an option for contrast. So you could choose to increase the contrast white on black, blue on yellow, yellow on blue, etc., or continue to have it as black and white. So that can be very helpful as well, um, especially not only students with learning disabilities, um, but also students with low vision or visual impairment, portable visual impairment, and other types of um, instances where they may want the high contrast or the inverted colors for reading that information. That can be done through the Simplify button, which is really nice. So we're going to close out of that tab. And by clicking on that purple puzzle piece, that toolbar disappears. So if I click on the purple puzzle piece, it appears. And if I click on it again, it disappears. So students only need to pull down that toolbar as they need it. It doesn't have to be there if they don't want it to be there. Now, as I mentioned, these tools can also be used in Google Docs. I'm just going to click on my apps again, that left square of squares. And you can see Google Docs is also an app that you can use to immediately get to your Google Docs page and start a new Google Doc if you want to. You do have to get rid of this little toolbar here to start a new Google Doc. So we're in a new Google Doc. The purple purple piece is above, and I click on that, and now this toolbar pulls down in order to use with Google Docs. Now you can see a lot of the same features are available at the top, the text, the speech, the dictionary, and picture dictionary. So if you as an educator or professional are sharing documents with your students and they need to have that read out loud, worksheets, handouts, things that you're creating, if they need that information read out loud to them, Share it with them as a Google Doc, and now that text-to-speech is available. The highlighters are there if they want to highlight important information. There are a couple additional tools for supporting the writing process when you're in a Google Doc that are on the toolbar. So the additional writing features to the top left is a little what's called prediction globe. So some people think it looks like a head. It says prediction when I hover over with my mouse. I'm going to click there. And now this box appears, and while I'm typing, you can see that it's predicting what I may be trying to type. And this word prediction predicts phonetically and contextually. So phonetically, as I type the first couple of letters, what I may be trying to spell and having difficult time with is populating. Contextually, as a student or individual starts typing about one particular topic, more words about that topic are going to populate and become available on the spot. If they're still not sure what word they want, they can simply hover over it with their mouse to hear it out loud. And it does read the words out loud to them, the same voice you heard on the internet. And then they can click on that word when they hear the one they want and put it into their document. The other option is they can hit Control and the number that is next to that particular word, and that will also put it in a document. So if they prefer to use the shortcut keys, they can do that. So very nice to have word prediction available for students to help support their writing, especially those who may be slower typers or struggle with grammar or spelling. And then the other option available is the speech to text, the built-in voice recognition to allow students to type using their voice. So we are using the speech input tool on the toolbar in Read and Write for Google in a Google Doc. It is the icon that looks like a little microphone headset. It's built in. No training is needed. You just click on the headset. It begins listening to your voice and typing what you say. 
you click on it, you see a red dot up here. Now I can speak my words and it will type what I am saying. So you can see it just put the sentence that I said onto the screen. There's no need to train it ahead of time. It begins working immediately. It does work with the built-in microphone, but I do highly recommend with any voice recognition, even if it's for your built-in, that you use a good noise canceling headset because it does cancel out ambiance noise. And it does allow for more accuracy and efficiency when a student or an individual is speaking. So it makes less mistakes and is less frustrating. So for your students who would benefit from word prediction or speech to text voice recognition, this is a great option for them to be able to use this toolbar. So again, this is all part of Read and Write for Google, that purple puzzle piece. And I'll show you one more thing before we take questions and move on to the other extensions and apps. Clicking on my little app icon, square square. I'm going to my drive, and I'm going to pull up a PDF because this does also work with PDF. So if you have worksheets that are already a PDF, for example, that you have students complete or your student receives a PDF worksheet in their Google Drive from a teacher, and they want to be able to use these tools for filling in the worksheet, you can see that the toolbar appears at the top. This is just an example of a worksheet. Um, if I click on the T, I can begin typing. I can delete what's there, and I can type something new. I can listen to this out loud before I put it in my document, so I can make sure that's what I want there. There is to speech, so I can certainly listen to the directions and the information on this um, PDF worksheet. I can hear it read out loud. It's the same voice again that you heard on the internet. And I can also create highlights. It looks a little bit differently, but if I highlight text, this little mini box of tools appear, and I can highlight the text. And something extra, these little annotations. So I can leave push pin notes wherever I want to. So I can type and save it. Now that push pin annotation is there. And when I go back to click on any of those push pins, you can see that we can get to the notes. If you have PDFs that are not OCR, optical character recognition, that are not accessible, there is an additional app that you get for free using Read and Write for Google called SnapBurder. It is on the list under your app section. It's on your Google Doc under the app section, which uh, is further down as we get through it. And it does allow you to use a mobile device to take a picture of worksheets and use with this toolbar. So if you're worried about that, you do have the option for a tool that will do the OCR optical character recognition and make your PDF accessible. So moving on to some of our other extensions, just so you're aware, there is the description of Read My for Google in your Google Doc that we're using today. This is the copy of the Google Doc that you have a link to. You are going to have this saved in your Google Drive and as a document for you to use after the training and workshop. And again, this webinar is being recorded for your use afterwards as well as you need it. Um, so there is a description here of the Read and Write for Google. So it is something that students can have for 30 days for free. If they don't continue with the subscription after 30 days, the text-to-speech with highlighting always stays free. So even if you just need a really high-quality natural sounding voice for text-to-speech for Google Docs and the internet with highlighting, this is a wonderful option even to try to use those other supports. Um, educators and professionals can have a free subscription to this Read and Write for Google toolbar, unlimited. The link is there for you to register as an educator or staff member. Any staff member of the school, related therapist, et cetera, that has a school email will be able to register and have this extension to use unlimited. Again, on the internet in a Google Doc or PDF. So um, you have that option there. And you have those links available on your Google Doc. So now I'm going to be going over some of the other extensions that are on the Google Doc before we move into the app. Again, both extensions and apps are gotten from that same place, that Chrome Web Store that we learned at the beginning. If you click on your little icon of apps, the square squares, and you go to the web store, the little beach ball and beach bag. This is where you can search for those apps and extensions and hit that plus sign to add them to your list. 
Uh, the read and write subscription I forgot to mention, if students decide to have it after 30 days or schools decide to purchase it, it's $99 a year per student, which is about $2.50 a week. So not only have schools been using it for students, they can get group rates, they can get school-wide licenses, but parents can also afford it for students, and college students who are using this can afford it for themselves if it's something that they need. So I'm going to close out this Google Doc, and what I'm going to do is go back to that Aristotle website, and with my extensity, I'm pulling up my list of extensions, and I'm now going to disable Read and Write for Google. I'm going to click on that, and it's grayed out, and I'm going to open up the next ones on our list. And the two next ones on our list are Readability and Clearly. They both work very similarly. If you don't have Read and Write for Google and you like that Simplify button to have information from a website in a nice, clean reading environment, these two extensions are free. In fact, the remainder apps and extensions, well, a couple of the ones are subscription-based, but most of these apps and extensions are free. So Readability and Clearly are both free. And both do similar, as I mentioned. They do offer a clean reading environment. Uh, clearly, which is this little icon that looks like a desk lamp, it's now to the top right. I just enabled it by clicking on it. It's this little desk lamp. And it does sync with Evernote. So if you have students who are already using Evernote, clearly syncs with Evernote, which you'll see. So if I hit this little desk lamp now, what it does, Actually, I might have to use it in a different website. There we go. So now if I click on the Clearly button, I'm going to hit Refresh because I didn't refresh when I pulled up. I'm pulling up the Clearly. There we go. So I just clicked on the little Clearly desk lamp. And you can see it takes that website information and, again, pulls it into a nice, clean reading atmosphere away from videos, and other distractions. You can change what the text looks like, and you can choose large or small text, which is nice. You can have that information read out loud. And you see the little Evernote or Elephant icon, icon here. You can clip this to Evernote. And the icon at the top there, that little arrow, brings you right back to the website that you were on. Readability does the same thing. Again, they're both free. Readability has similar options and feeds to Kindle. So if you have students that would want to feed that to their Kindle if they're already using one, you might choose that one instead of Clearly. So again, when you are searching for apps and extensions, you're searching for features that your students need, and you want to look for the one that might be best for them to use. It does look like we lost connectivity, so make sure we get connected again so that you can hear what I'm saying. Hopefully. Oh boy. Network connection, there we go. Technology is always wonderful when it works, and tonight it is challenging us. So clearly, as I mentioned, the little desk lamp icon nice clean reading interface and syncs with Evernote. And if you choose readability, very similar features and syncs to a Kindle. So you want to look for the one that your students would best use. Uh, another extension on the list is Select and Speak. And I'm going to move some of the, through some of these very quickly just because of time. But you'll have this list to refer back to. Select and Speak is another option for free text-to-speech while you're on the internet. So if you're looking to try other text-to-speech options when you're in the web store, just put that in as the feature that you're looking for, text-to-speech, and you will be able to try out other text-to-speech options, including select and speak. The one after that is high contrast. So again, I am using my extensity to enable these extensions as we're using them. So as not to have them all running at the same time. And usually this goes very smoothly, so I'm sure it's just internet connection this evening. And we are going to click on high contrast. And it's a little black and white circle, and it says high contrast. And now you can see that icon to the top right of my screen. It looks like a moon, half white, half black. And when you click on high contrast, 
and enable it by clicking Enable. You can see now that you have similar options to a CCTV. You can go from normal to increase, grayscale, inverted, and again, many other options that a student with a CCTV might be using. But this is just with a free extension. Um, so if they don't need the CCTV necessarily to do the research, they can have a high contrast right here by using this extension. And of course, this could be used with the built-in magnification. Control plus if you need to magnify the text as well. And that extension is free. It is on your list. It's called High Contrast. And I'm going to pause for a minute just to find out if there are any questions from the audience that need to be answered before I continue on with these extensions. We saw that there was a question that came up in the chat. Hopefully the administrators can read them to me if there's anything there. Otherwise, I will continue on and answer more at the end. Okay, so I'm going to continue then with the extensions on the list, Wolfram Alpha. If you haven't heard of that, again, it's on your Google Docs. And it is wonderful for accessing information. It's like an online encyclopedia. Um, and basically, you can type in any questions. Wolfram Alpha can also be accessed just by their website on the internet. But this is their Chrome extension. This is what the icon looks like. It's in my top right. And with Wolfram Alpha, you can ask anything about science or math or any topic, really any topic. Why is the sky blue? And you're going to get that information. If you type in something that has to do with algebra, for example, um, like an algebraic e equation, So we'll do this one and then hit the equal. And now you can see it's going to pull up all the information about this particular algebraic expression that I just typed in, 2x plus 5x. We did lose connection, so hopefully we're getting reconnected quickly as Wolfram Alpha is graphing and solving and bringing up information about the equation I just typed in. OK, so you can see that I typed in 2x plus 5x. And with Wolfram, it brings you into a separate page with information on that particular math problem. You can type in questions about any topic or subject. And you can research sample questions that are already on here. But it's really, again, like having an online encyclopedia and better for any topic or subject that they might be studying or using. Now we're going to go to my Stesby and turn off my Wolfram Alpha. And again, I've done several trainings on all of these apps and extensions, as you can imagine, countless times. And they typically run well together. So I'm sure that this evening's difficulties are probably the internet connection on my end. It is storming here. That could be part of it. So I apologize. But if you try out these apps and extensions, they should work smoothly for you. And Grammarly is another excellent one. So Grammarly, Spell Checker, and Grammar um, that are in need of grammar support and spelling while they're typing. You may have heard of Gingersoft before. There is a Ginger extension as well. I've tried both. And this one is Grammarly. I really prefer Grammarly. I found it to be more efficient and easier to use as far as corrections. But again, they're both free, so you can try them out yourself or your students can. Really, really great as far as offering grammar and spell checks while you are typing anywhere in the Chrome browser. So that includes Gmail when students are Gmailing friends or instructors or professors or teachers. When they are online, many applications for work are now online. The majority of applications for work are online. Their resumes are online. They're filling out forms for college applications um, or just forms online for other purposes even social purposes, and the grammar and spell check works in all of those environments. It's really wonderful and robust. Um, so check that out. And I do encourage them to use it on Facebook and other things if they're already using social media. It's going to help make corrections. And certainly if you're using it to stay in touch with friends, uh, they'll find more applications to use grammar support while they're typing, emailing, filling out forms online, et cetera. And that is the Grammarly extension. It is also free. The next one on the list. One tab and session buddy, the next two on the list. These are similar and also excellent and both free. I've clicked on session buddy first. 
This is one that I use professionally almost daily as well, but very often, and students would find helpful. There are several out there like it. This is just happens to be the one that I like called Session Buddy. It is free. With Session Buddy, it keeps track of all the tabs you have opened. So if your students are studying a particular topic and they have all these windows open, and now it's time to switch classes, they have to shut down, they have to go to another computer, and they want to know how to get back to all those tabs they had open for what they were researching, even if they have to shut down and go home. When they get back onto their home computer, they can click on Session Buddy before they shut down, hit Save, and now they're going to name this session. and click OK. Maybe they'll put the date. I typically put the date as well. So we'll put 824 here. And now on the left-hand side here, you can see my CCD session saved. And if I click on that, so if I shut down, all my windows go away, I get home, I open up the Chrome browser, I click on my session buddy icon to the top right, and now I can go over here to the left click on my CTE session, and I can get back to any of these windows that I have open. It is an option in Chrome in your settings to open back up to the last place you left off, but many students and educators don't know how to do that. So Session Buddy is a phenomenal option. I also like the way that you can save the sessions and get back to several. So maybe you can open back up to where you left off, but maybe you can get back to sessions that you saved previous days that you wanted to get back to. So I really like having the Session Buddy and going to my extensity to turn Session Buddy off. And another one that is also similar and free is One Tab. So again, if you click on One Tab, what this does is you see it takes all those tabs and literally puts them into one. And your list is still there. And you can save it. And this also saves speed because the more tabs you have open, the slower it goes. Um, so One Tab. Session Buddy, both excellent to have, both free and great to use. I'm actually probably going to keep one tab open um, and use it throughout the rest of the session. Maybe we'll see if it helps to keep some of the glitches from happening. You never know. So the next one we're going to pull up is One Click Timer. So One Click Timer, this little icon here, my mouse is always over it in the top right again. Nice visual and audio timer, very large. Set it for one or two minutes or all the way up to 60 minutes. And that little, you can see it's counting down from two minutes. The little sound is a very nice one when it plays in two minutes. It will pop up on the screen and it will notify us that our time is up. Um, so great for students who you have two minutes and then you're moving on to the next thing, et cetera. Did we start it? There we go. So you can use one click timer as a visual timer. And also mentioned in the list is to check out. It doesn't look like it's counting down. It. it is important to realize in order to use these Chrome apps and extensions, you do need to be connected to the internet. And you do need to have good connection to the internet, or they can be glitchy. So we're learning a good lesson this evening. So your students will certainly be able to use these apps and extensions if your school has good connection to the internet, whether you're hardwired or Wi-Fi, and if your students have access to the internet at home or at a local library, they will be able to use these apps and extensions for homework and for use for any other purposes. They can also go to a public restaurant where there's public Wi-Fi, the apps and extensions will work, but you do need to have access to the internet in order to use these Chrome apps and extensions. So check out the timers. There's one-click timers, there's progress bar timers. Also on the list, um, Digo for annotating bookmarking, sharing web pages. It's phenomenal if you haven't used Digo before, D-I-I-D-O. Uh, one of the extensions on the list is called, whoops, I lost my extensity list. There we go. Um, just a reminder, you need to have good connection to use these apps and extensions is what we were talking about. So awesome screenshot. It does keep these in alphabetical order, which is nice and extensity. Awesome screenshot capture. And I'm trying to move quickly to get to apps, but I'm just going to say you definitely want to check this out if it's something you or your students can use. You, it's control 
V and Control C and just a few shortcut keys that you learn, and it takes a screenshot of the web page, and then you can annotate it. You can circle, you can type into it. So whether you're filling something in or you're using it, you can save it to your drive, you can share it, you can print it out. It's really, really neat. Uh, so check out that awesome screenshot. So now we're going to move on to our app. So I'm going to go to my main page of apps. And again, apps show up here when you click on that little icon, square, square. And then you get your apps on your main page. Several for you to check out on this list. The number line, really neat. So the number line provides an interactive visual number line, of course, for students to work with. You can change the value. So it's in ones. You can change it to twos, fives, tens, twenty-fives, and hundreds. You can count by ones, fives, or tens, for example. Clear that away. You can also start by doing math problems, perhaps start at six. Add six more and you get to 12. So really neat, a little interactive number line there that you can use. And that is an app. And that is free. Another app on the list. And I'm just going to jump around a little bit. You can feel free to go to any of them on the list yourself afterwards. I just want to get to a few of the great ones. To-do list. Um, and another great thing about using this Google Doc that I provided for you, all of these apps and extensions not only are listed, but there is a, there's a hyperlink to get to them in the App Store. So if you can't find it in the App Store, just click on that link. It's going to bring you right to that app in the App Store for you to download. So this is To-Do List. I really like To-Do List. It's very simple. There's other options. As I mentioned, you might find a better one. But it's a really great way to set up a quick and easy to-do list. Maybe you're using it. Maybe your student's using it. And I like that you can set up more than one and have them side by side. This is really great for time management. You can see today's to-do this week and this month. Um, very quick and easy. If I want to add to today's, for example, I'm in this little area here. And I'm just going to put Math 2 for time purposes. Oops, spell it right, Diana. So we have Math 2, Enter. It's now here. I can move it as far as priorities on my list. I can move it to the top. I can check it off when I'm done with it. I can exit off of my list if I need to. I can do this week so I can see what is today's homework? What's coming up this week for projects or papers? What about this month? And after school, what do I need to do? To create a new list, you just put it in at the top, new list. Hit create, and boom, you're good to go. There's your new list. All of these apps and extensions work with the student's login. So these lists are going to be waiting for them when they get home to do their homework. Now, there are really great brainstorming and mind mapping apps that I want to point out. There's four or five on the list. Check them out because they all do something slightly different, but they're all wonderful. Um, there's also apps for planners and um, scheduling and reminders for homework, which are great. But I'm going to show you some of the mind mapping and brainstorming. One of them is Connected Mind here. And you can see it's similar to Kidspiration or Inspiration. It's also free. You start off with a new blank template. It's going to show you an example of the mind map as it pulls up here. And you can start off with a blank template. You can add space and connect them, or you can add images that they save from the internet. So you can mind map and brainstorm those ideas before writing a paper. Another one that is similar is Lucid Chart for Education. And what's different about Lucid Chart for Education, you will register, sign in with an email and password. It's all great. Um, Lucid Chart, you can start a new document, and it has shapes that look a little bit different. Or you can use their nice templates. And you can see on the right-hand side, you can choose templates for different categories and the education templates. So why don't we create the wheel? Here are nice templates already here for you, for your students to fill in, which is a wonderful feature. That is Lucid Chart for Education. It is on the list. It is also free. And um, some other ones that are on there, you'll see you can check out yourself, MindMoto and MindMeister. You may just prefer them over others. MindOMO, quite a few. There's Dolch Sight Words, My Homework, and My Study Life. As I mentioned, these are great planners with scheduling and reminders. You can set up entire calendars, get reminders for homework assignments. Um, really, really wonderful for time management, again, and planning. Um, some other 
add some extensions on the list or here for math, like GeoGebra, History, Time Maps and World History, Useful Periodic Table, Typing Club. There's really so much. I really encourage you to search the App Store, um, as I mentioned, and the majority of these are free. If you get to download an app and you don't like it, I'm back on my app page now, you can right click and the drop down menu appears and you just simply click remove from Chrome. If it's an extension and you dislike it, the top right, my mouse is here, it's a little uh, menu, like a notebook, or some people call it a hamburger. You will scroll down to settings, click on settings, on the top left you see extensions, you click on extensions, and you just will simply click on the trash barrel for the extensions that you want to remove. Uh, again, they're all on the list with hyperlinks. Further down in this Google Doc is a wonderful list of resources. I need to open back up my one tab here to our Google Doc. Um, so this Google Doc that is available to you, again, hyperlinks at the end of it. There are great websites for more apps and extensions based on topics. There are great videos for using apps and extensions, Pinterest. Um, pages about Chromebooks and extensions, and also a Symbaloo. If you're not familiar with Symbaloo, it's also an app or an extension. And I'm just getting down to our resources here. So I've mentioned this Google Doc. There are a lot of supporting uh, resources here. There are um, videos and other information on using Google Classroom, which is just like using an online platform for your students. There's a Symbaloo here. If you use this particular app, you can save several. You can use this yourself. Um, and they've created a Symbaloo of apps and extensions. You can use this for any purpose, really, which is really neat. Um, again, I just want to mention apologies for the technical difficulties this evening. We didn't have them last week. Hopefully, we won't have them next week. And if you are interested in taking the online course, Click on the upcoming courses. You can choose apps across the curriculum. That's this one. And if you're interested in participating, it's not too late. Three webinars, three weeks of discussion boards, and a couple activities. You can earn the CEUs from ResNA. Um, and I will post that information online. And you can feel free to follow up and email me. And I'm just going to now stop sharing my screen so I can answer any questions that you may be putting into the chat. And want to thank you ahead of time if you're exiting for your attendance this evening. And I don't see any questions in the chat. I'm not sure if that's because we restarted, but hopefully everyone's questions were answered this evening. And All right, Diane, yeah, they are. Uh, can you hear me? OK, you have. Yeah, there was a question from, let me scroll back up a little bit, make sure I don't miss anybody. Uh, do the words come automatically in a table in reference to the app that you were showing? Okay, sure. That must have been in reference to the Read and Write for Google and the vocabulary. Yes. And yeah, uh, if, if whoever posed that question is still listening, while Read and Write for Google using a vocabulary tool, you highlight the words with a colored highlighter with the mouse, and then click the vocabulary tool, and yes, it automatically populates into that table. Uh, with the definition, the symbol. You can also change that symbol to a picture that you save from the internet, and then that little notes section, which is really great. So it does happen automatically. All right, and thank you for that. And the next question is, can this be used in conjunction with Bookshare? And I apologize that we didn't get that uh, to know which one they're talking about, but maybe the text-to-speech. So there is actually a specific extension for Bookshare, and we're going to be talking about Bookshare in depth next week's webinar. So tune in for that. But there is an extension separately from Bookshare to read those out loud. OK. And this last one, it looks like it says it's the full version. I'm not sure exactly what they're referring to. But is the full version still only available for a 30-day trial? Yes, the full version is a 30-day trial for students. And that's for the Read and Write for Google, that entire toolbar to use. And that is available for 30 days for students and educators. Educators can use the link on the Google Doc to have it unlimited, a free subscription unlimited. And after the 30 days for students, the free text-to-speech will stay. 
And then the other, if they want the other features other than just the free text to speech, they would need to subscribe. And that was $99 a year. They can contact that text help link. That is the company who makes the extension if they decide to purchase it thereafter the 30 days. Okay, and the next one is what is the benefit of one tab and how it changes the user experience beyond power consumption? Um, so the, the option to, of course, consolidate one tab so that your computer is moving faster instead of slower because you have several tabs open, and there will also be the ability to save that list of tabs to open up again and get back to. So if you want to save your session similar to Session Buddy, you'll be able to get back to all those websites that you had open if you have to shut down quickly. Great. Okay. And the next question is probably more a question for us at CTD. Can I get a recorded view of last week's webinar? And that has actually been posted to the site. So if you go to the CTD site, uh, you should be able to access the link to see uh, a copy of last week's webinar. Great. Yes. So definitely the recorded webinar from last week for anyone who wasn't able to attend and wants to start on the course now or even just see the webinar from last week on the iPad app and iOS app. That recorded webinar is available on the CTD website. Look under the course. And for those of you who are taking the course, it's going to be in week one. So yes, you can absolutely still record or access that recorded webinar from last week. Uh, Cheryl, the All discussion right. board yeah, on the CTD website. Um, so if you go to CTD, you want to make sure you log in. If you're taking the course, you will have to create a free login. And once you log in, You'll be going to the apps across the curriculum and platforms to support struggling learners. And then you'll click on Participate Now. And when you get into the actual course itself, you're going to click on Tools or just scroll down to the bottom. And you will see the tools available, which are the course files um, and the forum, the discussion forum. You're most welcome, and thank you, everybody. Oh, it looks like I'm, there we go. I think my microphone is working again. So thank you for your participation and questions, and look forward to our webinar on free assistive technology resources next week. Thanks very much, Diane. And thank, thank you for you bearing for with us through the, uh, <laughs> the technical issues. Yeah, hopefully issues. not next week.